In discussions about the lore and story of Stalker, the word canon is often utilized to describe the official series of events that took place within the Stalker world. However, the boundaries of the Stalker canon are usually not clearly defined, and the canonicity of many elements is still up for debate. So what is the Stalker canon exactly? While I do not ambition to precisely answer that question, this is the topic we will talk about in the video. Indeed, my intention is not to rule what is or isn't canon, because it is not for me to decide, but instead I want to start a discussion on the theme and raise awareness among fellow stalkers. To begin with, and in order to fully understand what we are talking about, let's take a look at what canon means in this context. In pop culture, the word canon refers to the aspects of a story or fictional world or universe that are considered to be official, meaning they have been confirmed within the story or in some other way. Other definitions further add that canon refers to the source material, in other words, what has been authentically produced by the creators of the franchise. Although this seems to be rather straightforward, different people might have different ideas and interpretations as to what is or is not canon. Besides, even the official information can be confusing or even contradictory in several cases, making it difficult to grasp what is really canon and what's not. But more on that later on. Further, there is also what we call headcanon. Headcanon is a personal take, basically it is what a fan believes or wants to be true about the lore. In the rest of the video, I will give some examples of popular headcanons within the Stalker fandom. Now, if we apply the concept of canon to the world of Stalker, then it appears the core structure of the canon is composed of the three officially released games made by GSC, Shadow of Chernobyl, Clear Sky, and Call of Pripyat. Also, the upcoming Stalker 2 Heart of Chernobyl will be a brand new addition to this canon. Before proceeding further, let's get the elephant out of the room. Stalker Mobile. In case you didn't know, there actually exists a Stalker game that was made for mobile phones, developed by QPlays and GSC Gameworld. Information about this game is scarce, and most of the fans have never played it, myself included though the general consensus is that this game is not canon. The main reasons for this seem to be that most of the work was made by QPlays instead of GSC, and that the format of the game does not allow it to integrate well within the rest of the Stalker franchise. Thus, the story of the mobile game is vastly considered as fanfiction, and Stalker Mobile is overwhelmingly regarded as not canon. Moving on, I think it is clear that all the mods, in spite of their popularity, are not canon. It may seem obvious, but I still believe it is important to state this again, because I see many people using elements only seen in mods in order to support their theories about the lore. The abundance of such modifications, along with their ease of access, means that many players both veterans and newcomers to the franchise, can easily be influenced by the content of these mods. But don't forget, their lore remains fanfiction, so I suggest to be careful with where you get your information from. Let me give you an example. Within the community, I noticed many people are convinced that mercenaries are of western origin. I am not sure where this ID came from in the first place, but it's been developed in mods to such an extent that it has become part of the headcanon for a lot of players. However, the original games do not feature any concrete evidence pointing towards the mercenaries being westerners. Nobody is perfect, and I myself was fooled by such things in the past. 
My takeaway from this is to check the origins of the data yourself, to make sure the information can be trusted. Another source of lore one might be tempted to get into are stalker books. Several books taking place within the stalker universe have been published by different authors over the years, with varying levels of quality and success. Though once again, these are mostly considered non-canon due to their fanfiction nature and conflicting storylines. What's interesting about this is here we see that the quality of the fan-made work and IDs plays a large role in their adoption within the headcanon of the players. The better the quality of a story, and the more sense a theory makes, the more likely they are going to be accepted by other fans into their head canon. And so we've come full circle, as what remains to look at is the work made by GSC themselves. Though before we dive into the released games, we have to mention their development and the sheer amount of cut content and abundant IDs that came with it. Indeed, there are many elements that did not make it into the final release, especially in the case of Shadow of Chernobyl, which had a long and complicated development history. And it can be argued if some of this stuff is or isn't canon. On one hand, there are elements that were removed for good reasons, such as simply being bad ideas or not fitting the vision the developers wanted to achieve. On the other hand, there are elements that the creators would have probably liked to get into the game, but for some reason they could not, be it due to time constraints or technical difficulties. The problem is that we don't always know for sure why a specific element was cut, so it's difficult to put them into one of the two categories. What we can do, however, is look at how far these elements made it in development. To begin with, we have the rough ideas and concepts which were cut very early in development. We can usually read about these in design documents, but more often than not, these things never went beyond the status of notions and theories. Examples include artifact transmutations, the thing in the fog, mutant transmitted viruses, and the zone becoming sentient. I think it is safe to assume these are not canon since they were rapidly cancelled, yet some of these concepts can still fit into the game world we got on release, so it is not impossible they make a comeback in the future. Then there are elements which were developed beyond an idea on paper, when devs actually worked on game files and sometimes even implemented them into some of the builds. We can remember for example the cut weapons such as the P90, mutants like the Fracture, old locations, characters and factions including the infamous Sin, as well as a bunch of story related stuff. Most of it was properly removed from the final products, so it is usually considered to be non-canon, however there are some exceptions. Firstly, some things technically remained in the games in the form of unused game files. For example, we can find character biographies and several interesting PDA entries that for some reason are unused in Shadow of Chernobyl. Should these be considered canon? I am honestly not sure. On one hand, these elements fit very well with what we know, so it feels like a waste not to use them. But on the other hand, there is always the suspicion that they did not appear in game for a good reason. Moving on, we also have cut elements which still appear in the game in one way or another. For example, the cat mutant can be seen as a stuffed animal in Duty's zoo in clear sky. The dead city can be seen on the PDA map even though it cannot be visited. The last day faction is mentioned by Barkeep. And so on, you get the ID. For these specific cases, I believe the elements are canon, but it is honestly up for debate considering their inclusion could be due to a mistake or an oversight. Which finally leads me to what actually appears in the three games. 
A wise man once said, when using a video game as a source of canon, one must consider the separation between a genuine detail of lore and a gameplay mechanic. This is absolutely true in the case of Stalker, especially since the games are not supposed to be the most realistic games out there. Let us consider this. Did Strelok manage to disable the Brain Scorcher and make his way to the power plant, uncovering the secret behind the zone? Yes, this is what Shadow of Chernobyl tells us. Did he do it by fighting his way alone through hundreds of monolith soldiers? Probably not. This is what I mean by the separation between lore and gameplay mechanics. Because the player is given a lot of freedom, and because these are games that are supposed to be enjoyable, not everything you do or see in the game is to be taken as a serious piece of lore and canon. Just because you can do something in game does not mean the character you are playing as would have done it in the real story. What can be taken seriously, however, is the general layout of the storyline and its events, notably the scripted sequences, as well as dialogues, cutscenes, and so on. Unfortunately, with Stalker it is never that simple. Indeed, even the official games contain some contradictory and unclear elements which make it difficult to figure out what is to be considered canon. Due to the complicated nature of the story and its creation, oversights, plot holes and retcons have appeared. The fact these are never properly addressed and explained does not help either. So let's take a look at some examples of such ambiguous stuff. In Clear Sky, Scar visits Strelok's hideout and discovers his last exchange of messages with his friends before he went alone on an expedition to the center of the zone. However, when we visit this stash again in Shadow of Chernobyl, we find new messages between Strelok and Ghost. This should not be possible, since Strelok never returned from his trip to the CNPP. Thus, there seems to be a disconnect between the way the two games depict Strelok's whereabouts. In a way, it looks like Clear Sky retconned Shadow of Chernobyl, yet it remains up for debate. On the topic of Strelok, there are many strange things about him. Throughout the series he has a few different appearances. His in-game models, cutscene models, and so on, never seem to have quite the same face. Also, characters who have met with Strelok before were not able to recognize him when they saw him again, mainly Sakharov and Guide. A popular headcanon is that Strelok simply wore a helmet or a mask that covered his face, but who's to say? As for Strelok's friend Fang, he somehow has two different graves and it is still unclear if this is an actual mystery of the zone or a simple mistake from the developers. Furthermore, we can cite artifacts, which are basically the same in Clear Sky and Call of Pripyat, having the same names, design, properties and requiring a detector to be found, while being completely different in Shadow of Chernobyl, and visible to the naked eye. Once again, is this a mystery of the zone, or just a retcon? Who knows at this point. As you can see, there are plenty of examples, these are just a few. All of this makes the actual canon of Stalker harder to define, and ensure that many different head canons will be created by different players. However, this is not necessarily a bad thing. In my opinion, the mysterious and unclear nature of so many story and lore elements is what makes the setting of the zone so interesting, and it is always fun to create your own theories and try to find explanations for these plot holes. Moreover, it also makes sense from a humane point of view. We, the players, are not perfect. We make mistakes and cannot possibly expect to learn or understand everything. 
The same can be said about the developers. But more importantly, it also applies to the characters from the zone, even the powerful sea consciousness itself. So who actually knows if we can trust what an NPC tells us in a dialogue? Hearsay, rumors, and straight-up lies exist within the zone just as they do in the real world. And that is one of the reasons why Stalker is so immersive in my eyes. Anyway, enough of my ramblings. I hope you enjoyed the topic of the video, and make sure to share your thoughts about all of this in the comments. I will try to read all of them. Thanks for watching, and until next time, take care.